ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, bienvenue à Paris. Ahlan wa sahlan bikum fi Paris. It's my great pleasure to welcome you this morning to this panel discussion on how to invest and set up in the Gulf. As we gather here at the French Ministry of Economy, I'm honored to stand before such an esteemed audience of business leaders alongside foreign and French officials. Your presence here signifies the importance and the potential of the economic relationship between France and the GCC region. Over the course of yesterday and earlier this morning, we have had the privilege of engaging in insightful discussions and hearing from key figures, including the informative keynotes that were delivered earlier this morning. These conversations have underscored the immense opportunities that lie within the GCC region and France, and I believe we can all agree that the question of why to invest in these jurisdictions has now been firmly answered. Today, our focus therefore shifts to why, from the what, sorry, today our focus shifts from the why to the how. How to navigate the complexities, how to leverage the synergies, and how to maximize the potential of investments between France and the Gulf. This is both a timely and critical discussion as France on one hand and the GCC region on the other are undergoing dynamic transformation that presents unique opportunities for growth and collaboration. France and the Gulf countries not only share a rich history of economic and cultural ties, but also common legal traditions rooted in civil law. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, which in an unprecedented move recently promulgated its first ever civil code, has now reaffirmed its anchoring and the anchoring of its legal system in the civil law tradition, like other countries in the region, thereby strengthening its connection to France, where one of the first civil codes originated and inspired many others that came thereafter. The GCC's ambitious Vision 2030 also aligns closely with France's economic development plan, creating a fertile ground for mutual investments and business ventures. Our esteemed panelists are here to guide us through these topics and share their invaluable insights. Each one brings a unique perspective and expertise, making hopefully this discussion all the more enriching. Now, without further ado, um, let us meet our panelists. But before I do, as any good lawyer, I must offer a small disclaimer. First, I apologize in advance to the panelists, to you, because I will not be able to do justice to your extensive career passes and qualifications while introducing you. Otherwise, I risk spending half of the session's time uh, reading your biographies to our audience. So I'll be very brief in my introductions, and I'll invite everyone, please, to review um, our speakers' biographies online, and I'll also casually introduce them to you by their first names. Um, unfortunately, uh, uh, Mohammed bin Laden, who is the president of the Saudi uh, French Business Council, um, is not able to be with us today due uh, to a last-minute emergency. Uh, we will try as best as possible to fill in his position uh, in the discussions. Um, I will start with uh, uh, Jean-Christophe, uh, who is the chairman of the French Chamber of Commerce and Industry in Bahrain created in 2015 to foster and promote economic and commercial links between France and the Kingdom of Bahrain. Jean-Christophe is also the former CEO of BNP Paribas uh, Maya region and the former CEO of the National Bank of Bahrain group. Uh, to uh, Jean-Christophe's right is Jinan. Jinan is the regional counselor for intellectual property for the Middle East based in the French embassy of the UAE. Uh, she is also a researcher, a lecturer at uh, Blaise Pascal University, amongst other, and an authority in the field of intellectual property. Uh, to Jinan's right, I have the great pleasure of introducing Fahed. 
Fahad is the country CEO in Saudi Arabia uh, at the first Abu Dhabi Bank, uh, the largest UAE uh, bank, and the chairman of the Foreign Banks Committee and board member of Fab Capital. We're very fortunate to have uh, Fahad with us, who uh, also represent the uh, rising and talented uh, generations that are also helping transform Saudi Arabia's landscape. Uh, to Fahad's uh, right, um, uh, we have Khalifa uh, uh, from Kuwait. Khalifa is the managing partner of Al Yakut Al Fawzan Legal Group in Kuwait. He's a seasoned lawyer with extensive experience in commercial, civil, and administrative law, and highly also regarded for his expertise in advising uh, on litigation matters on behalf of clients across various sectors. And finally, to his right, is Gustave, who heads uh, the business development activities of TKO Capital, uh, an alternative asset management firm headquartered in Paris with over 44 billion euros of assets under management. Uh, Gustave relocated to the UAE last year. He leads the development of TKO's franchise across the region, and we'll be hearing from him, uh, particularly with respect to his experience you know, from the French perspective, investing in the GCC and vice versa. Now, Without further ado, um, let's start our discussion with Saudi Arabia. Um, as you know, uh, Vision 2030 is a transformative economic and social reform plan uh, that, of course, necessitates significant investments from both domestic and foreign sources. And this ambitious, this ambitious vision naturally requires a robust legislative framework to ensure investor confidence and security. So I'll start with Fahad. Can you tell us more about the recent regulations uh, and reforms that have been implemented in Saudi Arabia to enhance the investor's experience? Okay, great. So uh, thank you, thank you, Abed. Um, first of all, you know I'm, I'm very happy to be here um, in front of such an esteemed uh, audience. Uh, it's a pleasure, indeed. Uh, so you know, there has been a lot of reforms in the kingdom lately in the past really, I mean, 15 years, um, more so. However, in the past really five years, we've seen a, a rapid uh, shift in changes across the board, be it the investment climate, the uh, economy, judicial, uh, legislative, across the board. In fact, a month ago, uh, one of the credit rating agencies uplifted its credit rating for the kingdom from a stable outlook to a positive outlook. And one of, the, one of the main reasons behind that was because of such reforms to support uh, FDIs, support B2Bs, G2Bs, B2Gs, etc., which are very important and fully in line with Vision 2030. In fact, going back 15 years or so, um, the World Bank started a report called Doing Business. And um, all the economies of the world, the countries of the world, were competing to make as many reforms across the board as possible to get a higher ranking on the ease of doing business in such an economy in, in a particular country. Those were the days actually where I was actually at the World Bank and this report was started by the World Bank team back in 2007, I believe, or 2006. So really, I mean, it's, 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 it's been very positive, uh, the changes we see today, and I'll name a few. Uh, so from the judicial side, uh, today, the, the, the turnaround time for, let's say, litigation, and since we have here Khalifa with me, um, has really enhanced significantly um, past really two, two, three years. And that by itself, along with, of course, transparency, and that by itself really gives a positive uh, sort of environment and comfort, including assurance, to FDIs, uh, not just to the local companies, but also, also international companies. So we really see a positive sort of uh, really fast mo movement going forward. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Fahad. On, on the, it's interesting you mentioned litigation because, of course, access to justice is, is a key, key factor for investors. I, I would add also that arbitration, which is widely recognized as a key indicator of investor confidence, 
uh, as offering a reliable and, and impartial mechanism for resolving international disputes. And, and when we have jurisdictions that are arbitration friendly, usually they attract more foreign investors uh, due to the predictability and of, the, of the system. And Saudi Arabia has recognized this and they have embarked as part of their vision into a massive reform to support arbitration as a means of resolving potential disputes with investor, thereby promoting the kingdom um, as an arbitration-friendly jurisdiction. And that's a very important message that is sent to foreign investors that also uh, arbitration now uh, is a possibility. Of course, now we're focusing on projects and everything going well, but it's important as well uh, to, to think of these aspects. Uh, um, and we've, on Saudi, we've had the pleasure this morning of hearing from, uh, from uh, Mishal Ben Omeri, and that gives, you, gives us all a, 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 an overview of the scale and the endeavors uh, that are being put in place to, to, to transform uh, the kingdom uh, over the coming years as that transformation has already started. Now, of course, beyond the legal framework, uh, a robust banking sector is crucial for supporting ongoing projects. And I, and I know, uh, Fahad, that from your vantage points, you've been doing a lot to assist and support uh, French companies entering into uh, the Saudi Arabia, but as well as the flow from Saudi to France. Are you able just to give us more insights onto, into those initiatives? And if we have time, um, perhaps focusing on the, uh, on the banking sectors and, and how Saudi Arabia is embracing fintech innovation. Uh, thank you, very good, good questions. Um, so, you know, we all know that banks play a pivotal role in any economy in the world, let alone obviously since we're speaking about Saudi Arabia, particularly Saudi. Now, you know, uh, Michelle earlier spoke about Vision 2030, which is, which is a very ambitious uh, vision where, you know, we're very grateful to, to be a part of it as, as Saudi nationals, as um, entities in the kingdom uh, to support the vision and work hand in hand together. And, you know, the good news about the vision is that if you look at the main, um, the main pillars, uh, so each pillar has have KPIs. And it's very positive to see that the majority of these KPIs have been overachieved as of May or June 2024. Um, and, and again, you know, I mentioned the credit rating of the kingdom, et cetera, and this is again because of the transformation that has been done, including Vision 2030. So having said this, going back to banks, um, so, so some the, from the banking perspective, um, in promoting the French-Saudi corridor, um, I'll give you a few examples on how that play a really important role. So uh, today, for example, First Level the Bank is really leading this from a regional perspective, being you know a regional, uh, large, uh, one of the largest regional banks, where we work hand in hand with local entities, Saudi that is, to enable them to penetrate the French market and vice versa. So I've, I've had several meetings during my visit this time, and I, I always come to Paris where I meet CEOs, chairmen of, of French companies that either are already there in the kingdom, but not where they want to be. And there are entities that want to penetrate the kingdom where we have the leverage, given our outreach, given our local know-how, and including with government entities. So for example, uh, you know, a PIF. We have direct access to PIF, which is one of the major, major players in the kingdom, particularly around Vision 2030. So we work with French entities to enable them, okay, uh, to work in the kingdom, including setting up the right introductions with the Ministry of, of Investment, Commerce, etc., etc., etc. So our role really goes beyond just banking. Our role goes in holding actual hands of entities wanting to explore and wanting to do business in Saudi Arabia in line with Vision 2030. We do support local entities in France as well, where we, where we do uh, in the form of partnerships. So that's something we welcome also. And again, going back to the, the access to France 
for local Saudi entities as well, where we obviously have a big role here in, in, in France. Uh, we have Christophe here, CEO of uh, FAB in, 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 in France, where he actually, we work together hand in hand to further develop the French Saudi corridor, which is very, very important for us. So we, we don't really look at it as a transaction, but we look at it as a strategic partnership, okay, at, in the form of uh, in, in promoting the G2G relationship, which, which I, I believe is very, very strategic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fahad. Now, shifting our focus to Bahrain, Jean-Christophe, could you tell us more about the key factors uh, that make Bahrain an attractive destination for foreign investors, and how do they align with Vision 2030, these objectives? Good morning, everybody. I'm very pleased to be here uh, to promote Bahrain, and, and probably because, as we saw yesterday, a lot of people in the room don't know uh, Bahrain and don't know the advantages. Now, we'll start with the high-level uh, advantages, but I think giving some examples, and of course, I will interject when necessary when we talk about specific topic. I would start, <coughs> I would start by, the, I would say, the main, uh, the main uh, advantages. Number one is people. People is key in many industry. Uh, but when you come and set up a business, when you set up a shop in a country, you need to find resources, you need to have educated, uh, for, educated uh, employees, and you need to be able to, if necessary, attract uh, foreign competencies. Now, that is one of the strengths uh, of Bahrain, and I've been talking to many French companies through the French chambers, even some people here. The, the word they use, yesterday we say people-friendly, I think I would add competence. Uh, when you meet uh, Bahraini decision makers, CEOs, commercial uh, managers and so on, the general trait is they are friendly, but they are very competent in their own field. And I think that's, that's something which has mm -hmm. always been the case in Bahrain. Number two, vision. We talk about <coughs> vision 2030. A lot of countries have embraced, including France, of course, now, Vision 2013 Bahrain started in 2008, so it's, it's been a long journey. It's not something which we did to adapt to the mood. It's something which gave us some time uh, to uh, you know, adapt to the environment. So this uh, Vision 30 has been, do has been done uh, through uh, priorities uh, and, of course, monitoring of, of the performance. So the vision is something which I would say is a, is a special trait in Bahrain. Uh, if I give some example, the financial hub in the Gulf used to be Bahrain. It was the only one. So you know, the, the, the foresight 30 years ago, 40 years ago, to say we need a strong banking sector was done in Bahrain. The necessity to have legal framework, which is up to international standards. Again, that's something which has been put in place you know, 30, 40 years ago. Of course, it has evolved. Uh, and that goes to my next point, agility. The agility is not to implement something and just wait, uh, but constant uh, amelioration, constant adaptations, and so on. And if I take two examples, the legal system, for example, the legal system is introducing regularly uh, new concepts, one which has done a lot of, uh, I would say, uh, a lot of, uh, create a lot of action in Bahrain is the um, uh, uh, restructuration and bankruptcy law, again among the first in the GCC. Takes some time to implement, but now it's something which is, has been uh, tested and, and which works. Uh, I know that we are going to talk about intellectual property. Uh, again, uh, the kingdom was uh, the first country uh, to implement a law, 2006, so that we're talking to uh, about a long time. Uh, there have been a number of uh, amendments, improvements, and so on. It's, it's not my field, but it's just to give confidence that it's not uh, a snapshot at a certain point in time, that there is a team which is uh, adapting uh, to uh, you know, the evolution of the market. Now, Vision and, adapt and agility goes with implementation, of course. And if you see, uh, I was mentioning uh, proudly that, uh, that, the, uh, that Bahrain used to be the financial center, and 
Now every GCC country has a financial center. Now the, the key is to be able to adapt, to be able to change, to shift. And today, uh, for example, in the banking sector, uh, there is a leading, Bahrain is a leading force in Islamic banking. Is is has been one of the first to develop. Uh, we talk about fintech, but I would say more digital financial services because fintech is, for me, I'm an old banker, that's why I will say, but fintech is, is a concept, it's, it's a tool. What is important is to be able to serve the clients in the most efficient manner, and this is a digital transformation. And by the way, this digital transformation is not only at the corporate side, it's at the government side. When you interact with ministries, with uh, government uh, entities, it's mostly digitized. So you have both the friendly, competent approach people to people, but you also have a very efficient uh, digital system put in place. So that's, uh, that's the important uh, elements. I, if I have to summarize, people, vision, agility, and implementation. Thank you, thank you, Jean-Christophe. I'd like to pick up briefly on the point that you made in relation to Bahrain being uh, a, a financial hub traditionally for the region. And the question is today with the fast-paced developments in the GCC, how is the kingdom evolving its traditional strengths? Um, it was, as you said, uh, the gateway of the Gulf. Uh, and what are the strategies to maintain uh, a favorable, uh, whether corporate or, or, or tax environment, to stay competitive within that overall uh, dynamic? Uh, framework. Yes, that's a very important question. Bahrain is a small country, one and a half million people, uh, and of course, compared to the giants, Saudi Arabia and uh, and, and, and and the UAE, it's it's a different size. However, uh, it's a country which is very well perceived within the GCC, where we are well integrated in the GCC. Parts, obviously, parts uh, part of the uh, economic uh, union, and we are particularly close to Saudi Arabia, which is on the other side of the bridge, and, and, and the UAE. Uh, we, we don't see that as competition, but of course integration should and does benefit the growth, uh, the growth of Bahrain. So that's, that's one point. Now, the other point is Bahrain can still remain a gateway for companies setting up manufacturing plants, for example, or technology hub for the GCC because what I just mentioned, excellent relationship, well perceived and so on, but also other countries. Countries in the proximity, the Levant, for example, North Africa, East Africa. And you see some, if I give some examples, uh, Amazon Web Services set its regional hub in Bahrain. That, that was chosen. My old employer, BNP Paribas, in 2002, created the regional hub, at that time it was just GCC, in Bahrain. For the reason I mentioned at the beginning, people, visions, legal system, and so on. So the idea is there is still a good place for Bahrain to play the gateway Gulf. It's probably different than 10 years ago because of the evolution of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia in particular. Uh, but still, uh, we, we see companies uh, interested or even acting to create a base in Bahrain to re-export their products in the whole region. So there again, uh, agility is important. And what I mentioned, the adaptation of the legal system, the adaptations of, for example, uh, free trade agreements. Bahrain has free trade agreements with 22 countries, some more to come. The partnership you mentioned with Singapore for uh, arbitration. So there is a constant look for partners and for international reach. And I think that's the key, remaining gateway, but for a broader region. Thank you, thank you very much, Jean-Christophe. On, on the last point and, and, and the partnership, I think that's it's a recent development in, in Bahrain where uh, Bahrain signed a, a bilateral treaty with Singapore to establish the new Bahrain International Commercial Court. Uh, and a notable feature uh, of this court is that it will he hear international uh, commercial disputes, but also arbitration-related matters in both English uh, and, and Arabic. And this setup and the possibility of conducting bilingual proceedings is also meant to enhance foreign investors' access to local dispute resolution. And before I move to Kuwait, uh, those, uh, parallel, those looking to invest in France 
there is a very good parallel to be made here with the International Chamber of the Paris Court of Appeal, established in 2018, which has jurisdictions involving international trade interests. And what is important for foreign investors to know is that the protocol for this chamber allows the use of English in some cases before the French court. That is unprecedented. And for instance, documents may be submitted in English without translation and foreign parties, witnesses, or counsel, they're even authorized to plead before the Paris Court of Appeal and they may express themselves in English. Uh, to my mind, this is another sign of France's commitment to enhancing its attractiveness to foreign investors and facilitating access to its court system. Now, let us, moving from Bahrain, let us turn our attention to another very special Gulf country, where back in 1938, one of the largest oil fields in the world was discovered. That is Kuwait. Now, Khalifa, uh, I understand that Kuwait is also developing its vision 2035 this time, a development plan which uh, envisage a diversified economy uh, away from the dependence uh, on oil, and the plan focuses on various sectors such as air, maritime, rail transport, but also housing projects and urban developments, infrastructure and construction. Can you expand on how this plan seeks to attract more, invest, uh, no, more investments in the region that is constantly evolving. Uh, thank you, Ziad. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Business France for organizing this amazing event and uh, also being part of this event. It's really glad and pleasure and sitting with those experts to learn from them their information and their knowledge. It's something really added value for me. Uh, talking about Kuwait and uh, our vision 2035, you can see now Kuwait tendering a lot of projects. And recently they are uh, tendering a lot of projects and those projects it's uh, focusing on infrastructure, transportation and uh, different type of projects. That mean Kuwait, they want to change the uh, idea or the image about Kuwait that we only have the oil and gas. I think all the GCC countries now, they are like in competition, trying to attract more uh, investors to invest in, uh, in the region or the MENA. But especially in Kuwait, you can see a huge difference. Since 2014, when they established Kediba, Kuwait Direct Investment Authority, which allowed the foreign investors to own 100% ownership and that's it's an excellent entity and excellent laws for the foreign investor to invest in, in Kuwait and to have a lot of advantages like what we have now in Kuwait, what we are providing the foreign investors, like uh, tax and custom holidays for 10 years and offering lands. This is something that's really difficult to have it in, in region. But in Kuwait, if you get this license, so it's uh, really a very big advantage for the foreign investors. So we have in Kuwait different ways to invest and uh, we are like recently like um, having like a lot of new laws to attract more investors. But the way to invest in Kuwait, you can also have like a local partner to have like 49% uh, as a foreign investor and 51 percent as a, as a local partner. And the advantage of this to have a local partners who know the league, to, to know the market in Kuwait and to guide you to, uh, to the right point in, in, you, in, your, in your market or depends your uh, activity. Yani. The third way that you can uh, have it in Kuwait to invest in Kuwait, the agents. To, to have an agent in Kuwait, the advantage of this all the responsibility for the operations is going to be for the Kuwaiti agents. So you can just come to Kuwait and uh, go to any bid for any tendering with the Kuwaiti agent, and all the responsibility operations are going to be related to the Kuwaiti agents. And most of the foreign investors, they are preferring this way to invest in Kuwait. But recently, because a lot of companies 
they faced some difficulties to invest in Kuwait. The Parliament in Kuwait, they implemented a new law allow all the foreign investors to open their own branch without, a Kuwaiti, uh, without any Kuwaiti partners. But this new law, uh, it's not done yet because we are waiting the executive of uh, regulation. I think within one month, two months, we can have the uh, new uh, executive regulations. Kuwait trying hard to attract the foreign investors because the oil, the oil and gas sectors is not enough, trying to diversify their income from different projects. You can see the Gulf Rail. It's one of the big projects in Kuwait. We have also the Mean and Barak al-Kabir is one of the biggest projects in Kuwait. You can see a lot of like now, now Chinese companies. Uh, we can see a lot of Turkish companies. But we are trying now to focus also for the European companies, Fran French companies to invest in region, in Kuwait, especially in, Ku in Kuwait. I think some foreign companies, they are facing some problems when they are signing their contracts because our laws is really old. We are now trying to develop our laws. My uh, colleagues and uh, Ziad, they are mentioning arbitration. Before, in Kuwait, if you want to sign any project with the government, you cannot have any arbitration clause. But recently, with the cap, that any project, if you have it like PPP project between the government and the investors, they can ask to put an uh, arbitration clause in their contract. And you just need to take the permission from the highest mm. cost, uh, highest uh, committee from the tendering, uh, tender, uh, uh, tender committee in, in Kuwait, and they will give you the approval. If there is any dispute, you can go to the arbitration in, in, in anywhere, like, it depends the agreement. But still, our, our, our laws in arbitration, it's a very, very old, in 190, uh, 1960. It's under procedure commercial law. I think it's time to follow Saudi, Qatar, Emirates to have our own arbitration law because this is going to protect the investors also, and they're going to have more trust to invest in, in Kuwait. And from this stage, I think uh, the government knows about that, and they are uh, uh, working on it. I was in, I, I visited the Minister of Justice last, uh, last, before, I think, eight days, and I was telling him it's time to have an arbitration law. And he was like mentioning his desk. He said, listen, this is the draft. We will, we will review it in two months, three months. I think we can implement this new uh, law after reviewing it from the government. So thanks to Business France to give us this opportunity to talk today and to uh, explain our laws and what we have to attract more investors in Kuwait. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sharifa. On, on the arbitration front, indeed, I think I, I'm hoping... Uh, I'm hoping that the new arbitration law will follow the, the model law or the institutional model. I have no doubt about that. And I think what you mentioned is also very um, helpful uh, uh, because my understanding is that in uh, Kuwait there are um, um, certain procedures that facilitate investments as GCC structures or through GCC uh, companies. And that uh, another also way, good way to look at it is uh, investing in Kuwait through uh, vehicles uh, that foreign investors can incorporate in the broader GCC, whether uh, Jacques Sofi mentioned Bahrain or uh, elsewhere potentially in, in some uh, free zone, which we'll come to in a minute. Uh, is, is that something very briefly that, that you um, see or would recommend generally? We, we always recommend that it's anything going to make the procedure easier and flexible, it's always better. Yeah. I hope in Kuwait we have something like an offshore companies because it's something really useful and very easy. And we always advise our client to like open their own offshore companies because, you know, for today it's like a lot of acquisitions deals, merger deals, so it's easy for exit and uh, easy for the companies to have like offshore areas. So of course I recommend it, but I hope also in Kuwait we can have like this environment yeah. and we can do the same because uh, in the end, anything gonna facilitate or gonna make the environment uh, easier and better, it's, it's always good for 
the investments for local and uh, foreign, not just for the foreign investors. And don't forget that if you attract the global companies to the region, it's going to add value for us and experience and know-how also to train our uh, Kuwaiti's uh, people, you know. This is the benefit from uh, like uh, the global uh, companies to have them in, in, in Kuwait. And also they will take their benefits because with Kadiba they will like avoid taxation, yeah. tax holiday for 10 years. And this is something, uh, it's not normal. Yeah. I, 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 it's not any country can, can offer something like that. Yeah. But Kuwait, they're offering it because we need those uh, companies. I can tell you some examples we have in Kuwait. Google, Microsoft, uh, a lot of big companies they are now, they have their own uh, license under Kadiba, and the government deal with them as a Kuwaiti entity, yep. not as a foreign Interesting. entity. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for these insightful comments. Uh, I think briefly on, on Kuwait and France, uh, it's probably worth mentioning that uh, BPI France and the Kuwait Investment Authority, uh, the Kuwaiti Sovereign Wealth Fund, have recently announced the creation of FKF. Uh, it's a bilateral private equity fund designated to co-invest with BPI France through funds uh, directly and indirectly in the capital of unlisted fintech SMEs and mid-cap. And that, again, uh, to my mind, underscores France's attractiveness as an investment destination. And the creation of uh, FKF uh, is a prime example of this. Now, arriving in the UAE, uh, a nation that has perfectly embraced the global modernization trend, the structure of the UAE with its offshore zone is remarkable, uh, although similar zones exist in the other GCC countries. Uh, I would call these zones as common law islands in a notion of civil law, and uh, we'll discuss them in a minute briefly. Uh, and the Emirates also offers a highly attractive and cutting edge legal framework with an impressive level of uh, uh, legislative activity, it is also a very business-friendly country. And on this note, I turn to you, Gustav. Uh, you recently re relocated, uh, we, well, you recently relocated to the UAE and opened uh, TKO's first office in the GCC, choosing the ADGM, the Abu Dhabi Global Markets. Uh, can you tell us more about the process of setting up in the ADGM, the framework, the ecosystem, and any significant differences uh, that you see across the region. And for me, and for all those who are here, why did you choose the ADGM uh, over other offshore zones in the GCC? Thank you, thank you Ziad, and, and, and thank you Business France for, for hosting this, uh, this wonderful event. Um, I think, I mean, if we listen to uh, our esteemed panelists, uh, there is now, I think, a leveling playing field when it comes to the attractiveness of the whole region. Um, so, you know, we did not choose the ADGM uh, because it is superior to another center. We've been speaking with QFC, with King Abdullah Financial District, with ADGM, with the IFC. Um, and I think that for us, and you're absolutely right on the common law island, having a fully independent uh, regulator such as the FSRA in the case of uh, the Abu Dhabi authorities, an independent uh, adjudication uh, courts that would prevent us from going uh, in onshore, meant that as a financial investor, um, this degree of flexibility and independence was highly attractive. But more than that, because as we've heard, this is now happening all around the region, the ecosystem and the business friendliness was, was particularly attractive. Uh, why is that? Um, at TKO, so we, we raise money, we channel money from savers, pension funds, sovereign wealth fund, and we invest it in, in the real economy. Some of our portfolio companies were very active in the UAE. Um, and so when we decided uh, last year to actually building on several years of business development in the region to open in the ADGM, we looked at the ecosystem and we looked within ourselves what made sense for us at this stage uh, in point in our development. And some of our portfolio companies such as, you know, uh, Aegis, uh, Yogosha in the cybersecurity, Aegis in, in uh, infrastructure and, and uh, consultancy, were very present in the UAE and we decided that given where we were and given the actors in the Abu Dhabi ecosystem, i.e. long-term patient investors, and we can talk about it a bit later, it made a lot of sense for us to be close to our existing investors, to our portfolio companies, as to best position ourselves for future growth. 
having said that, we look at now, you know, the broader GCC, our co-founder was on, was on Bloomberg recently talking uh, about the, the growth in the region for us. We are bullish on the overall GCC. The ADGM for us was a point of entry. We really appreciated the proactiveness, uh, the common law aspect. We had a key point of contact from the beginning of our inquiry, which meant that it was extremely easy. You know, we regulated in 15 countries and as asset management company and a listed one. So having this ease of communication was crucial. Um, so this is just the first stepping stone of, of many. And when we see what's, what's happening and indeed as, uh, you know, everyone has mentioned, learning from each other. We are just um, excited to compare and adjust to the local conditions to grow our, our footprint in the region. Uh, the ADGM is a great uh, center. KFD is increasingly attractive to us and, and Saudi, of course. We're talking in Qatar and across the region. So this was the first step. And we see that the way the different zones are um, moving ahead is very attractive indeed. Thank you. Interesting. I think uh, also to, to mention briefly that in uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, the kingdom is also looking to build uh, a DIFC type jurisdiction in, in Naom and, and potentially other parts of, of the region, uh, precisely also for the uh, reasons that you, you, you mentioned, um, Gustav. Um, be before I turn to Jinan and then Back to you, um, Gustav, um, on the issue of uh, the macro view of the region and IP. Uh, of course, we, we don't have any speakers from, from Qatar and, and, and Oman with us, but I will say a few words on those two jurisdictions, which are also significant players in, in the region that are also driving um, both economic uh, uh, development and a sustainable change. Earlier this morning, we really had the pleasure of, of hearing His Excellency, the Omani Minister of Energy and Minerals, discuss the energy transition in the Sultanate of Oman. His, his wise and pleasing um, speech was, will resonate with us. Um, uh, I would say briefly that also the Omani Investment Authority has launched the Future Fund Oman in January, and that's a fund with a capital of $5.2 billion, again aiming to develop the national economy and attract investors. Uh, Qatar uh, has also embarked on, of course, modernization initiatives and has created a robust legislation and institution. They have the QFC, as you, as, 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 uh, uh, you mentioned, Gustav. And uh, certainly the uh, successful delivery of the World Cup is a testament to Qatar's ability to offer global investors the security needed to invest. In France, looking recently at, at what has been happening between France and Qatar, BPI France and the Qatar Investment Authority also announced their intention to increase their investment partnership by about 300 million euros in the second phase. And this new phase will focus on strategic sectors such as healthcare and uh, artificial intelligence. Now, as we transition uh, from the various GCC countries to a more macro view of the investment climate in the region and the topic of intellectual property, which will be our final topic before we conclude. Um, I'd like to give the floor to you, Jinan. Uh, we are very fortunate to have you with us today uh, to talk about this point. Uh, Gustave then will provide a tour d'horizon uh, of the dynamics currently at play among investors across the Gulf, and then we will wrap up the discussion. So turning to you, Jinan, we know that investments can be compromised if IP rights are not adequately protected, uh, uh, with those rights are often seen as the cornerstone uh, for fostering innovation. Can you just give us a, an overview on the legal framework in the GCC and the recent developments in the fields of intellectual property, please? Thank you, Ziad. Good morning, everyone. I'm really honored to be with such an esteemed and distinguished uh, audition. And thank you, Business France, for having me. So I cannot agree more what, uh, uh, with you uh, of what had you, you have said. So it's uh, really important to have uh, uh, a good ecosystem, a good framework of intellectual property to promote innovation and to protect investment. It's the warranty to have a return on investment on any investment in any field, and especially in the innovation field. In the GCC, we have a really healthy uh, intellectual property framework, so uh, we can, in each country, protect the intellectual property, all the IPR, which intellectual property rights, which uh, uh, includes uh, trademarks, patents, industrial designs, copyrights, 
and uh, especially as uh, said Jean-Christophe uh, Bahrain was a uh, pioneer in geographical indications we have we can also protect in Oman and in Bahrain the uh, geographical indications for those who don't uh, who don't know what is the geographical in indication it is the protection of uh, the origin of uh, agricultural uh, products agri foods and the protection of uh, handicraft products so we can can protect all the intellectual property rights in the different uh, countries of the GCC. And all these countries all are also enhancing the intellectual property infrastructure. I can highlight what's happening uh, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, in 2018, they created the Saudi Authority of Intellectual Property. And this authority, in six years of life, has become uh, international search administration recognized by the World Intellectual Property Organization. So, for uh, filing the uh, the uh, the filing of uh, patents uh, in the uh, World Intellectual Property Organization, they and can ask to have. SAIP or Saudi Intellectual uh, Property uh, auth uh, Authority to be the search administration. There are few countries around the world that have this status. So, and they have multiplied also accession to uh, international convention. And this is the case of all the, the GCC countries. Also UAE has uh, accessed and uh, Qatar to uh, new, uh, international conventions re related to intellectual property. Maybe I can give, uh, uh, quantify a little bit what's happening. We have uh, the World Intellectual Property Organization, or WIPO, the Global Innovation Index. Global Innovation Index measures the performance of the countries uh, when it comes to innovation. How do they perform? We have uh, the infrastructure, the ease to do business that has, uh, has been, uh, uh, we talked about it in this panel, the ease of doing uh, business uh, the legal framework uh, and uh, the human capital and uh, for example UAE is 33rd among 120 economies that have been evaluated with this uh, global innovation index and uh, this year um, Saudi Arabia has gained 15 places in this ranking becoming uh, having a 48 place and I think uh, in a few years we will see really uh, getting even better in this ranking. So globally, uh, that's uh, a legal framework is very healthy. We can protect our intellectual property and the GCC um, and having warranty of having our return on investment in innovation or in any field. Thank you. Thank you, Jeanne. So building on that very briefly, if you were to summarize the main points that companies setting up in the Middle East need to pay attention to with regard to the protection of IP rights. Uh, maybe you can say a few words on that, then I, I feel that uh, Jean-Christophe may want to say a couple of words on uh, IP in Bahrain. I'm not a specialist, but that was part of my demonstration that Bahrain has a foresight. It's some, this intellectual property topic came up many, many years ago because of the contacts with foreign companies and so on. But the important point is not to have it, is to refine it, to adapt it. And as Jihan said, uh, recently uh, this, uh, how you call that? Geographical indications. Yeah, is, 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 is a good example uh, because they are, they are products which are important uh, for, for the country. So, uh, last point I wanted to make, I didn't have time to make it when, uh, when it was my turn, is the ecosystem. We talked a lot about ecosystem. We talked about my main point, but ecosystem is an important element uh, because ecosystem is beyond having, uh, you know, the right people, having uh, uh, other firms. It's also uh, a concept which we call in Bahrain, Team Bahrain. So, Team Bahrain is government, it's... Uh, uh, private enterprise, in foreign enterprises, in some time. and the idea is we work together to make it happen. So, make it happen means having ideas to be implemented. Could be legal, for example, it's a good example. Could be new contacts. Could be you know, new uh, opportunities. And this this uh, team Bahrain is uh, really at the disposal 
of potential investors. It starts with the EDB, I saw that there is a representative here, which is the Economic Development Board, uh, to facilitate contact, to guide, to show the way, to make it fast and efficient, and having the right level of contact. So this ecosystem is, has been developing, again, uh, over the years, but now is extremely efficient, and we see that for foreign company trying to uh, implement investments in, in Bahrain. Thank you. Over to so, you, back uh, to intellectual property. What I uh, can say or recommend, it's worth for any country. When you go to a market, you should protect your intellectual property. Yeah, right. And the GCC, and, and, and the, all countries of the GCC, it is possible to protect all the industrial and intellectual property rights. It can be done through national uh, uh, application, so country by country to go and to apply for any industrial property rights. And all the GCC countries are also member of Patent Cooperation Treaty, which is uh, a treaty related to patents. So we can apply for a patent through the World Intellectual Property Organization and then choose any uh, country that is member of this PCT or Patent Cooperation Treaty and go to, uh, to the market in this country and to uh, continue the process in these countries. So all the GCC countries are, are members of PCT, so for a company that apply at WIPO, they can go to national phase in this country, or they can also apply for patents with the GCC Patent Office, which is uh, based in Saudi Arabia, and we can have a patent uh, in Bahrain, in uh, Qatar, and uh, uh, also in Kuwait. Uh, for the trademarks, national application, of course, in every country. And we have Bahrain, Oman, and uh, the UAE that are member of Madrid system. So mm -hmm. through an international application, we can go direct to, uh, uh, to the national phase in this country, and uh, it limits uh, the costs because uh, having intellectual property, property rights have all its benefits, but it's a little bit costly, for, uh, especially for SMEs and uh, startups. So uh, they can go through national phases, and I know that Saudi Arabia has also uh, approved the accession to, to Madrid system. It is the case also for Qatar. So uh, we can go through uh, the international uh, path. No regional uh, title for uh, trademarks, but a regional law. That, so it's uh, very interesting because we have the same law that is applied in the six GCC countries. So for the companies that are willing to enter the market, it's, they understand uh, the legal framework for the six country altogether. So, and last but not least, uh, related to copyright, it is possible to protect the copyright, in, uh, uh, especially when it comes, for example, for the softwares, for uh, computer programs, they are protected by copyright. And all six countries allow a registration of uh, the copyright uh, within their uh, national offices or a Ministry of Culture. So, Thank you. protect your intellectual property uh, before going to the market. It's mandatory. It's not only for the GCC. It's really when entering any market mm -hmm. to uh, to to protect uh, the, our intangible assets uh, of the company. Thank you. Thank you very much, Inan. I will conclude uh, with uh, uh, you, Gustav, with the concluding uh, remark. Uh, maybe just one minute or two maximum because we uh, need to give the floor to the second panel. But as an investment company, TKO's role is to channel global savings uh, and capital to finance the real economy uh, and provide liquidity to investors. Uh, could you give us just a quick overview of the dynamics currently at play among investors across the Gulf? Sure. Um, thank you. So may maybe you know, briefly uh, as a Tour de raison again, as um, was mentioned. If you look at the at the GCC, you have more or less 27 sovereign wealth funds. They manage, on aggregate, 4.1 trillion dollars of assets. That does not include our friends, for example, at FAB and banking institution or insurers. And in addition, you have uh, a, a wide range of family offices, whose you know uh, AUM is hard to define, but probably north of a, of a trillion dollars. Um, so. What we've seen, uh, so that just to give you kind of the scale uh, and, and in the conscious of time, the trend that we've seen over the past uh, years is several things. And as companies that are uh, maybe looking to expand in the Gulf is 
two big themes. The first one is a clearer delineation of pockets of capital. What do we mean by that? Is that one work that you should do well in advance when you look to grow in the region is to identify who is doing what. And now, this is a full-time job, by the way. Um, you have entities that only invest internationally. You have entities that only invest regionally. You have entities that only invest nationally. Uh, you know, if you look at Adia in the UAE, they will only invest in international market. If you look at Mubadala, it's a combination of the two. If you look at the MENA uh, division of PIF, you, they really have a mandate to bring value to the kingdom and to the region. Then you have the themes. Uh, Tasaru, which only invests in electric mobility. Um, excuse me, uh, MGX recently announced in the UAE that only invest in artificial intelligence. So when you're looking to identify growth opportunities, spend a lot of time mapping those pockets because they are clearly defined and knocking at the wrong door can mean that you will lose uh, a lot of time. So that's the, the, the key one. And the second, and I'll, I'll close with that, is localization. I mean, it was touched upon during the panel, but now we see more and more um, the region, although interestingly, if you look at the data, they've invested more internationally, that the net stock of capital that they can allocate has grown, the focus on localizing knowledge, value, uh, capabilities has grown. What does that mean for us? For example, you know, we employ more or less indirectly 120,000 people in France, uh, so it's, it's pretty significant, nearly 3,000 people in the Gulf. How do we connect uh, the Gulf and French companies and answer this localization need and think about this when you go and you know meet investors or, or partners is what can we bring to the table so either we invest in a French company such uh, the example of Aegis is a good one that has identified in their business plan the region as a key engine of growth um, over the past two years for example Aegis has acquired four companies three in the UAE one in Saudi Arabia and have more than, you know, uh, I think tripled their FT in the region. So that's one way to do it. And the second way to do it, uh, it's to promote, and this is part of our job as a, as a shareholder and investor, those small, medium and um, growing SMEs to identify exactly uh, the key entries and key growth tra uh, trajectories in, in the region. We do that with, you know, SaaS providers in the ele electricity uh, optimization space, in defense, in cyber, but always highlighting how, what can we bring on the ground. Um, and why do we see that? Because now we see that investors and partners are no longer just passive investors, but what we call, you know, uh, silent asset managers. They want to see you getting involved as much as they will get involved with you. Um, so, you know, flying in, flying out is, is no longer possible. Um, being local is extremely important uh, and bringing value uh, will be the key to your success in the region. Interesting, yeah. I think that's, that's a good way to sort of conclude about sort of being, being, being local. Um, to conclude, uh, ladies and gentlemen, as we wrap up our panel discussion, it's evident from what you've heard that the synergies between the GCC region and France are incredibly promising. Uh, looking to the future, with France hosting the Olympics uh, later this summer and the GCC region uh, preparing to host world-class sports events in the coming years, we will undoubtedly witness yet another fascinating avenue for collaboration, which our next panel will address. And as Victor Hugo once said, there is nothing more powerful in the world than an idea whose time has come. The synergies between France and GCC are precisely those powerful ideas. And now is the opportunity and the opportune time to capitalize on them. On this note, I would like to thank uh, first, all of you attending this session and for taking the time to be with us today. But of course, a big special thanks to our fantastic panelists for their valu valuable contributions and their time this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you.